you look closely, you'll notice that one of the three men is played by Isaac de Boncolet, who played mm. Poté in the flashback section of the film. And in a different kind of film, you would expect when France turns away from the window, smiling, which she hardly ever does in the, in the film, you would expect that to be the conclusion of the film. But instead, we have this lengthy meditation on, um, on uh, the three workers at the airport. Could you talk about uh, how you came to this particular? I think it's typically <laughs> um, the confidence and craziness that could happen when doing a first film. <laughs> no, I, I, I have to say, I, I wanted that music written by Abdullah Ibrahim, and also I wanted the end of the film to be not her, but those boys working in the airport. And I also wanted them to load in the plane those piece of heart, you know? So in the first film, there is a sort of innocence. I mean, I'm speaking about me. Eh? I'm, I'm not speaking about other director. I had a sort of innocence that everything was possible. And the lens, the, the time, and I was so happy to have uh, Isaac being in both part of the film, in the mm -hmm. flashback and also in the in that scene. So I I don't know. I first time I see that for a long, long time. <laughs> um, yeah, I can. There is very little I can say except sort of trust, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But it's also That it wouldn't be w <laughs> boring or... Well, it's I definitely not boring. Um, I don't think anybody would use the word boring to describe... No, but you know, the, the, the kind of thing that are so... Um, yeah, you, you, I think it's, it's the trust and the confidence of a first film. Everything is so... Um, terrifying in a way in the first film that strangely gives uh, on the opposite uh, a confidence in I don't know if uh, I can say cinema but yeah in, in a way you know because you have to depend on something and with absolutely no shrewdness, you know? Mm -hmm. Sort of naivety, naivety, maybe, you know, I don't know. It's still, I still have this sort of innocence, I must say, and confidence. But n not like that, you know? <laughs> I feel, no, I still feel that I think I haven't seen that scene since Cannes, you know? I never seen the film again. Since 1988? Yeah. Jeez. You're missing something. No, <laughs> no, I mean, it's horrible to watch films, but, you know, I mean, it's... But with the distance, such a long time, I... Well, I think it's I a have a certain objectivity, thing. and I... Mm -hmm. Uh, it's good. Yeah. Mm. Well, this film was really um, critically acclaimed. Um, it's yeah. your first feature. It really got a lot of attention, and it was widely praised. And I think that people assumed that you were going to make a certain kind of film. And I can remember a couple of pieces coming out at the time of Chocolat talking about um, the colonial femina, the, the feminine colonial, you know, that this was the kind of direction that people expected you to go, and then you made two documentaries, um, one uh, called Man No Run, which was shown in the, in the series on the Cameroonian musical group Les Têtes Brûlées, and then one on Jacques Rivette. And then your next fiction feature was um, Sans Fou La Mort, No Fear, No Die. And one of the, uh, uh, Isaac de Boncolet plays one of the main characters in, in that film. A lot of people saw that as a real, as a real departure for you, although obviously, um, you hadn't made that many feature films yet, but 
Uh, I think there was a real surprise at um, at uh, what kind of a film real disappointment, it was. even you can say, because um, Chocolat was uh, also a sort of commercial success. I mean, in a way, you know, unexpected, mm -hmm. but it did. So when I did uh, Sans Fou La Mort, I guess um, the people who had distributed Chocolat was, were expecting me to go on on a more Romanesque. And I was offered many films in Africa during the colonial era, um, even commercial for coffee and things like that, you know, as if all my future was designed to be uh, a director filming um, white people uh, under the tropical sun, mm -hmm. you know, sweating and suffering from a frustrated love or things, something like that. And of course it's impossible, mm -hmm. you know, it's not because I was brave or that you, no one can um, exist and makes film in one pattern forever, mm -hmm. you know. And that scene was strange because um, working together with Alex Descas and Isaac, who were friends in real life, but also rival because they were both actors, was um, very interesting, mm -hmm. you know? So I think the film was um, physically, um, for the first time, I realized that uh, to choose handheld <coughs> camera was not only um, a sort of modern way of making films, but uh, only because I was aware that to be with both those actors was um, a sort of I don't know. I was not sure to have them both on frame at the same time in a balanced way. So mm -hmm. I decided handheld camera as if I knew I was going to run after them all the time. Not only me, Agnes, who was mm -hmm. holding the camera too. So this film was not, I never into intellectualized the mm -hmm. film. I made it with a, a very honest feeling of those two guys um, working, uh, organizing cockfights, clandestine cockfights, having no right to live on no green card, you will say, here in America. Uh, I don't know. It was a very simple film to, for me to, it was written in a, I don't remember, I read in the newspaper something about clandestine workers and the script was written very fast. I wanted the film, actually the film was supposed to take place in Berlin. I, maybe I told you. <laughs> Yeah, because I read in a newspaper something about this French man who owns a restaurant in, in West Berlin at that time and who was organizing um, clandestine uh, fights in the cellar. And, and I decided to make the film and that I got the money from Berlin and then the, the wall <laughs> fell in November and I was supposed to start shooting in December, something like that, and um, the money was, of course, not used for film, but for mm -hmm. more important things at filmmaking. So, um, 
finally the film was made in France three months later. But still, it was um, a moving film. I was almost this wall falling was like a sort of opening. It was not a. I never consider it was. A, um, a drawback for us, mm -hmm. you know. I thought, well, let's make the film elsewhere, you know. Mm -hmm. well, Berlin was changing every second, no money was there anymore, uh, you know. Mm. The look of this film is very different from Chocolat, in part because of the, there's a tightness in the, yeah. in the framing and, and the handheld camera. camera. Yeah. And yes, and me, we had never, I suggest that because I thought, to keep both those guys with with the the birds and um, it's it's not possible. We should do and hell and neither Agnes or me have done that before. So we train together, you know. And we were walking in the street with cameras, so we get used to walk with. I mean, it was very interesting. I mean, films, to make a film like that was also, it's like a, a first film also, you know, in, in its way, you know. And I think since then, I've been trying to make all my films like a first film. And thanks to No Fear, No Die, because I understood Chocolat was not, was gone, was, was, mm. I was not going to be um, in jail with Chocolat, you know, I was afraid. <laughs> there's a, there is a real sense of, there's, a, you have a really broad range in, in your films. I mean, you've really, even though um, you can see real consistent preoccupations and, and patterns at the same time, you really do get the sense that every film that you've made represents a kind of new um, new discovery. There's connections between them, mm -hmm. but there does seem to be a real process of uncovering something new. Here, for example, I think the training of the birds, those scenes are just absolutely stunningly beautiful. And one of the things that comes up in all of your films is the way in which um, you show gestures, you know, the bodily gestures. Um, again, people use the word choreography to describe a lot of aspects of your films because the relationship to the human body is so attentive to the various ways in which literally people take up space and move through and move through space. But I owe a lot of to Alex and Isaac because Alex went to Martinique and trained for two months and a half, and he actually became a trainer, uh, you know? And Isaac went there too for two weeks. Mm. So both of them were so... For me, to work with both of them at that moment was um, a climax, you know? Mm -hmm. I. I I thought maybe I will never make a film after that, but to work with both of them was so enrich enriching, you know. Yeah, uh, they were so free, and they had absolutely no. Um, ego as actor, they wanted to be, their ego was working inside their character, you know? And for me it was, um, I learned a lot with them. And the connection, the only connection I have from film to films are the crew, because it's mostly always the same crew, and the actors, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I hope my next film to 
to be with Isaac de Broncoli. Right. Mm. I think for me it's where where I received everything, you know, from from their acting, from actors, and to work as a, a group of person who find a lot of um, authenticity and pleasure to work together. That's why I, I have this freedom to be, I don't know if my range is very wide, but uh, they give me a sort of eagerness to, to be curious, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I never know if, if I ask myself, I was reading the poster, acclaim my name and acclaim filmmaker or whatever, and I, I don't know. No, it's true. It's I'm not modest, but I think I was lucky to be a curi to be curious, to be. Um, Curious of people. Um, this was, this is something that make it, make it possible for me to to make film actually because um, I, I I am not sure. Um, I, I am I was never sure I was a filmmaker because. Every new film is something I try, you know. And I have no career in a, in a way, you know. I, I have only a life. No, it's true. Uh, again, it is not. A, I'm not a modest person, but uh, filmmaking was not a career. It was a, a way to be curious. Okay. Um, we'll move on now mm. to what was a very controversial film, um, your third feature, uh, J'ai pas sommé, I can't mm. sleep. You've described the first three films, even though uh, No Fear, No Die was different and, and was received very differently than Chocolat. Nonetheless, you've described the first three films as being a kind of trilogy um, concerning colonization and decolonization. And it's interesting that no Fear, No Die couldn't take place in Berlin because the way it does work is still really interesting because I'm assuming that the French woman in Chocolat is coming from Paris to, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, call me, whatever, but I just assume that she's coming from Paris to uh, visit her past. And then we move to the outskirts of, of Paris, to Rangis in, in uh, No Fear, No Die. And then in I Can't Sleep, we move to um, the city itself. And in each of these three films, uh, it's as if the differing um, relationships that are engendered by um, colonization and decolonization are explored. Um, before we look at the clip, because the clip that I chose from I Can't Sleep, <coughs> the clip that I chose is not the typical clip that you expect to see. Um, the film was inspired by a famous case in France um, yeah. concerning Thierry Paulin, who um, killed a number of, and supposedly with his Eighteen, probably. Eighteen old women. Mm. Um, he was called the... Uh, Le monstre. The monster, but he was called also the killer of... Uh, how do you say? Grandmother? Grand Gran yeah, grandmother. Yeah. Granny killer. Granny, the granny killer. killer. Yeah. yeah. Um, could you say a little bit about how you came to this particular, um, particular Yeah, it was topic? strange. I was approached by a huge big company, and they offered me a script, and... Um, actually, I didn't like the script so much, and I told them, and it was a, uh, also a real story, and they said, but you, you really made for real stories. And I said, okay, but not this one. And, <laughs> and uh, they said, pick up another one if you want. And 
I, I propose um, this case about um, so-called monster, nanny killer, knowing that they could not accept because this true story was exactly the opposite of what they wanted me to do. It was a true story that mm, in a way was not uh, mm, complete. The, 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 the monster died in hospital, not in jail, from aid. It was the beginning of aid and he was never judged and you know French people never recognize their um, in their um, criminology called history um, serial killer Mm -hmm. I remember when this real story happened, took place in the newspaper, it was always written, we don't have serial killer in France, you know, Wh which in a way was true. almost true, but it was such a strange reaction, you know, as if, no, we don't, we don't grow them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and. So I don't know. This 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 film was uh, hard to finance. Took me almost two years to find the money after I quit this big company, <coughs> who didn't refuse, but they asked the script to be a certain way. Um, that of course I could not accept, and and therefore I took me a certain time, and the film was in Cannes, and in Cannes it was like a big scandal. Not for the film itself, but because I, um, this apparently people felt the film was not um, judging or... Right, there was no psychology. And there was yeah. no moralistic judgment about why he did what he did. Yeah, the film was ending in in an open way. You know, yeah. the guy was in, arrested. He was not at loose, but he was arrested. But then that it was the end of the film. Mm -hmm. One of the... No, I think Sorry. one thing was his, his mother was there when he was arrested, mm -hmm. and his mother... Although she hold him in, his, in her arms, she said, how could I made you? And I think that shocked people, mm -hmm. I think. And it was strange for me because I thought it was the best part of the film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the reaction, um, the popular reaction to the film was, was um, it, it was maybe expected, but it was, it was peculiar because it was as if you were being accused, uh, like you said, of not providing a certain judgment, of not providing an explanation yeah. of why he did what he did. I was, I was accused of uh, killing again those 18 yeah. old women because yeah. I had no pay, no attention for them, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, <laughs> this is completely crazy. Yeah. One of the curious coincidences in, in the making of that film is that, well, first of all, I want to mention what I think is one of your great uses of music, and there are so many in your films. At the very beginning of the film, we see a Lithuanian immigrant woman driving into the city of Paris, and it's her discovery of Camille, the, of the, uh, the stand-in, as it were, for Thierry Paulin, that provides the thread of the film. You've described it as a goose game, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you move mm -hmm. in, a, in, a circular, in a circular structure. And um, she turns on the radio, and we hear Dean Martin and Lynn Renault singing Relaxez-vous. 
And this is <laughs> the song. It seems, and you do this all the time in your films. It's fabulous. The song initially seems like what, <laughs> you know, what place does this have? And then it just becomes this kind of perfect accompaniment to um, to what we see. And then Lean Renault eventually becomes a character in the in the film, and she plays. And we're going to see her in the in the scene now from uh, I Can't Sleep. But she also has told the story about how. She herself met Thierry Paulin. Um, the yeah, Aline Renaud, for those who don't know her, is a, she was a famous singer in the 50s. She went to Las Vegas because she was also a sort of cabaret dancer. And she was famous in France for being in Las Vegas <laughs> for eight years. Of, yeah. But she was, in another way, um, she, she was kind of despised in France because her songs were not so good and she was cabaret singer and whatever. And when we, sh but she's a great woman, very open, very generous. And she was, when she was 50 years old, she was in, in a sort of, huge cabaret in Paris called Casino de, pa de Paris. And she wanted for the revue to hire young men and women, good looking, to be naked on stage and everything. And, I say, and she said, Thierry Poulain, apply for a part in, in it. And, no. and Lynn Renault has a sense of humor that I love. A mother. Um, was her assistant, I say was, because her mother is dead now. And Lynn said, do you realize he was waiting two hours in the office alone with my mother? <laughs> <laughs> Could have killed her? And you know, she was, she was, she was very I'm sorry, funny. it's not funny, but it really is. No, it <laughs> is funny. She, she, oh, yeah, she's very funny. Is it, it is, is it her mother who plays her mother yeah, in the yeah. film? Yeah, okay, the, the, yeah. Okay, the clip we're going to see, now this, again, this is... Her mother was always with her, so I put her in the so film. So you put her in the film. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most important things about this scene is that um, the hotel that's run by Lynn Renault and where Daigo works just happens to be where the serial killer and his lover live. So. Now, one of the things that um, I think is just terrific about this scene is that it is a light interlude, but it's the kind of scene where you could make fun of, of people because they don't know what's going on right under their noses, but you don't. It's a really, um, um, it's a really touching scene and the, with the grandmother always in the, or the mother always in the background, that's the kind of horizon of the entire, of the entire film. That is an old woman who risks getting murdered. There is always, um a sort of emotion when actors, in that case, three actresses accept to to do a, 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 a sequence shot. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's difficult, you know, yeah. they have to do. And it gives so much to a film. So we said that it's a risk for the director, but it's not true. It's uh, they accept and and they carry the rhythm, mm -hmm. and I really dislike to watch my films, but that scene I like because I can see this kind of absolutely. This good, so such a good woman is Lynn Renault, you know? Uh, she's so, she's what she is, you mm -hmm. know? And she, even the way she sings, it's, it's very, <coughs> she could have made a lot about it, but she's simple with a real mother behind. Mm -hmm. I don't know, there is something simple and it's very moving that only 
for me, a sequence shot can create, right. you know. Right. That time, with no editing, with only the rhythm of the people who are in the scene, you know. And that's why I can watch it with, with a certain pleasure without judging myself, because it's all there, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. It's also real interesting that the title of the film gets spoken mm. by um, the uh, the mother of Lena Leno yeah. in the in the background because you think of the title of the film and you think you know nocturnal Paris people kind of wandering around um, crime or what have you and instead the title is spoken by but that was not planned exactly it just like happened that because <laughs> somebody else was supposed to say the line who was supposed to one of the boy. And actually, the mother was not, she was kind of old at that time, and she didn't, she kind of forget she was in a film or not. So when Lynn says to her, <laughs> you must go to bed, she, she was happy to be there. She said, no, 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 I can't sleep. You know, she was, it, and so I cut the line to the, to the boy, so I said, it's not possible that two two scenes so close with two characters, you know. Mm -hmm. And even now when I meet Lynn, she says, it's my mother who said the title of the film. It's my mother. <laughs> Always remember that, you know. Yes. <laughs> This is also, I mean, this is one of the privileged motifs in your in your films. It's also a dance scene. It may be unlike other dance scenes, yeah. but it, it is a it is a dance scene. I also think the choice of whiter shade of pale um, yeah. is just it's the way you choose these songs is just phenomenal to me. Um, I it's think of this. It's simple. I, I was I wanted Lynn to remember something about it mm -hmm. herself, you mm -hmm. know, and I. I mean, I'm sure many persons of my age do remember a lot about oh, yeah. that song, but <laughs> for, it, it was for me. Not that my memories are the same as Lynn Honos. It, okay. it was for Lynn. <laughs> I wanted her to to manage with, uh, and I didn't want. I, I wanted a, a song of the '70s. I, I didn't want it like 50s, you know, when she started being, I thought it was unfair to mm -hmm. her, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because in, in the 70s, she was very good looking, and she's still good looking. Oh, she's very, I think she's beautiful. Um, now, the next film that we're going to look at is Ninette and Bonnie, but before we move to that one, I want to mention, even though we don't have a clip from it, and again, in terms of dance, um, some of you, I know, were able to see U.S. Go Home uh, here at the Wexner, uh, which was a real treat because it's a really difficult film to see. Even in France, it's a hard film to it's a hard film to see, and it has what I think is going to go down in history as one of the absolute greatest dance scenes ever. And that's Grégoire Collin um, dancing along the Hay Jip. I mean, that's just it's a phenomenal scene. Um, and as coincidence would have it, the two actors that you worked with in U.S. Go Home. Grégoire Collin and Alice Horry, you're able to work with again in Nénette and Bonnie. Actually, I did Nénette and Bonnie because when we finished U.S. Go Home, U.S. Go Home was produced by TV. That's why also the prints are so difficult to find. And it was only four weeks of shooting. And I really discovered Alice was 14 and Grégoire almost 16. And I, I could not. Uh, it was not enough. I wanted to do more. To do more with them. Yeah. 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 Well, they really have a fabulous chemistry, as, mm. and they play brother and sister again in Nanette and Bonnie. And um, I know you've said that the way that you started to think about this film is that you read an article or a book about um, women, young women who give birth anonymously. It's not exactly. I mean, it's, okay. uh, there is a law in France. Um, that was, uh, that is, uh, I think it, it uh, t came from the Second World War. Uh, natality was down. going down, and they made that law for uh, st 
stop uh, abortion. So they, they said if a young girl, a young woman, or even anyway, a woman wanted to give birth in complete secrecy in hospital, it was possible. Uh, her name will never be revealed. And it was called uh, Accouché. Suzy X. Suzy X. Mm. The, the, her name will be an X, and the baby will never get the name of the mother. And kids that were born under X uh, start complaining that they wanted a trace of their mother. So the law was it's still discussed to be changed because it's, com it's difficult. Many women want the law to, s to go on, but many children want to find their parents. Who are by now grown up wants to track their mother down, at least to have a, a little bit of, of her. And that's, that's how I find so-called plot for the film. It's a story of a young girl of 15 who runs away from college to hide at her brother, older brother house because she's pregnant and she doesn't want a father to know. A father is a, their, their mother is dead. And the brother at the beginning doesn't want his sister back. But little by little, he, he, he they, they really, they fight a lot, but they, they stay together, and and the brother um, is like a sort of father for the baby mm -hmm. to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the the relationship between the brother and sister is really beautifully drawn in, mm -hmm. in the film, I think. But um, there's also um, throughout the film, and it changes in the course of the film. Uh, Boni, the character played by Grégoire Collin. Um, really has the hots for um, the neighborhood bakery owner. And sometimes it's funny. Um, the, his sexual fantasies will go on and on. Um, and he'll go into the bakery and you know, ask for a long, hard baguette. Um, it's, you know, <laughs> and um, then the clip that we're going to see, uh, this is such a beautifully done scene. He runs into the baker, um, the woman baker on the street one day, and she asks him if he wants to go have a drink. And so you can just see the look on his face as this woman just starts talking um, to him. And, and she's played by uh, Valeria Bruno Tedeschi, who um, some of you may, um, some of you rec mm. may recognize, um, who really embodies the role of, uh, of the kind of sensuous female who all the guys in the neighborhood are drawn to really, really wonderfully. That's why the brother doesn't want his sister, in, his sister to invade his house, uh, his stinking, dirty house, because he wants the space for himself, for his dream. Yeah. And he's afraid the sister might invade too mm -hmm. much his dreams, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Mm. There are these great moments in your films where people just talk. And it's like everyday kind of conversation, like talking about invisible or you know, pheromones and invisible fluids, et cetera. Uh, you never make fun of your characters, ever, um, I don't think. No. And, I um, like them too much. You like them too much. But this is also a kind of theory of the film, because the film is about those you know, fluids yeah. that tie people together. Um, the way that the look on Grégoire Collin's face during this, it's just so perfect. And even though you cut back and forth, you chose to hold the shot for a long time on, on, on each of them. So even if it's not a sequence shot, it still, I think, has some of the same effects. No, 
Yeah, it's <laughs> the same, but in, in my, you know, a sequence shots is, it's when the film accepts that two characters or three characters or, or six are together in the same image. But in that case, it, this young boy is dreaming of her. He never speaks to her except to buy the bread. And suddenly they meet in this shopping mall and she's open and they have a coffee together. And I thought, this is not fair to have them in the same image. Mm. He's dreaming of her and there she is in front of him. So then really I think the cut off, to mm -hmm. cut was necessary. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you could not feel that it's almost too much for him. It's almost better for him to dream of her <laughs> than to have her physically there, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I think that's why I separate them. Yeah. Mm. The sense of, of shock is just palpable on, on his face, you know, actually yeah. having the opportunity to um, converse with her. And then in a lot of ways, her sensuality, I mean, obviously it's visible in, in, the, in the bakery, but um, you can tell that the way she talks is also a real shock to him. But Valerie well. was also, um, she really loved because he was blushing and <laughs> she could see, you know, uh, so she was affected too, you yeah. know. She, she said, and I don't remember what, because she, she didn't remember the lines, you know. She was, <laughs> she was blushing too, you know. We made one shot on her, one shot on him. Um, so, but they were both shy in a way, you know. Mm. Mm. Yeah. We're going to see um, Grégoire Collin again in the next, um, in the next clip. Um, you know, I think all of your films are, are just terrific, but the next clip that we're going to see is from the film that um, people responded to, I think, much more enthusiastically than ever had been the case with any of your films, and that's, of course, Beau Travail, which has yeah. um, just been acclaimed um, virtually across the, across the world. Um, you'll, as I said, you'll see Grégoire Collin again. This is loosely based, and maybe you could talk about this a little bit before we see the clip. It's, it's loosely based on um, Billy Budd, and you yeah. hear um, Benjamin Britten's, pieces of Benjamin Britten's opera. Billy Budd throughout, the, throughout um, the film? After I did US Go Home for TV, Arte, it's like HBO, let's say, in, in America. Um, also, it's French and German. I was offered by them to do um, a film that was going to be part of a collection of films also. Like, US Go Home was part of Tous les garçons et les filles, um, Olivia Sayas made one, André Téchiné, maybe you've heard of that. If you come here often. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was offered to do a film that would be part of six films, like a collection, about, it was uh, a quotation of Deleuze, the French philosopher, being a foreigner and and uh, i i was told not to use a french doctor or not to use a journalist thing to be abroad a foreigner but to find something new because we french tv we have a lot of French doctors going places and journalists going places. So I was, so I really, as a joke, I told them, easy, foreign legend, because they're all foreigners and they go abroad, you know? So here I have the climax of everything. But this was a joke and, and yet also I, I I, I like those kind of jokes. It's like uh, Godard said once, if you 
got some money to use um, the brand of uh, water or brand of cigarette, then make sure it's it's big, you know, because it's it's stupid to hide it, you know. It's <laughs> make it like the main character, you know. So foreign years, I thought, okay, foreign legend, that's it. So it was a joke, and yet it was also a very solid piece of starting the work. Um, and then I became suddenly really interested by foreign legends, so I, as, I, as a child, I grew up in Africa, and I were, had been in Djibouti when I was seven years old, eight years my first, first year in school, really, you know. And I remember Djibouti was also a place where a foreign legend tra trained on very hot weather special training. And I made a very normal approach to the foreign legend. And then they kind of refused completely any use of their image or whatever. And then also I was told that if I was going to Djibouti to make that film, I would get into serious problem. So as I am curious and stubborn, I, I really decide to make the film, but instead of being helped by the foreign legion because, again, it was a very um, small budget film and going to Djibouti far away and expensive. I took 15 actors, decided this was my army, 15 person, and we trained for two months in, in Paris. And we made it on location, like the real foreign legend, but just next door, you know. <laughs> and um, so when that's how we made the film. When did Billy Budd? Ah, Billy Budd was uh, in my mind, like uh, right from the beginning. I thought that landscape, very particular landscape of Djibouti was this group of men were, were like a sailor on a boat, completely uh, alone, you know, like a, a men with men, <coughs> no women, no children, like men only with men. And and it was like a um, sort of pattern for me <coughs> to create a conflict inside this group of legionnaires, as if one of them, the sergeant, was suspecting his commandant <coughs> to be attracted by one of the young men. And that's it. It was a very vague pattern. But when the film was screened in, in New York, <coughs> I was told there was the, the, a group of very serious gentlemen that were the, the society of uh, Herman Melville society. I mean, they were. <laughs> but they wanted to check the film, you know. And I, I was afraid because the, it was such a loose pattern, you know. But they liked the film very That's much. Good. And they said, it's very Melvillian. So <laughs> we have nothing to say. It's completely Melvillian. One of the interesting details of this film, too, is the casting of Michel Subor in the role of the um, commandant because um, there's a real connection with Godard in, in this film in terms of Le Petit Soldat, the character he plays, uh, Bruno Forestier, yeah. is the name of the same character he played in a 1961 film by Godard called The Little Soldier. And so 
there's that interesting kind of homage um, as much to Forestier, it's, I mean, to Michel Subor, it seems to me, is to... It's a strange actor. He, he was a famous young actor in the 60s, and then he completely disappeared. And because in Le Petit Soldat, he, it's a film that was banned in France for a few years because it treated... The subject was... Uh, took place in Switzerland about... Uh, a guy who didn't want to go to Algeria. But then, in a way, betrayed um, twice by shooting a guy, a French guy, in the street of Geneva who was helping the Algerian revolution. So the, the last frame of the film is him running away and he says, there is a, the film is made with a voiceover, and he says um, that he was, he knew, being a young man, he has a lot of time in front of him to solve, you know, his life. You know? So when I met Botifava, I, I really wanted to, I was wondering, where is this guy, where is he? And I find him, he, he, he was living in the country, a well-off guy, he, he had become a businessman. And when I saw him, I really, it was the right sh choice for the commandant. And then I could link his character to the petit soldat, because when you enter the foreign legion, you can change your name, but also you're protected. You won't be arrested, you know. So. And he also is in your your new film. Um, the yeah, he is the main character in my new film. Yeah. You got yourself a real gay following um, after <laughs> after both travail. The, the film was shown in a lot of gay film festivals. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, how do you respond to that? I think Legionnaire, we're always uh, representing something very erotic, even mm -hmm. for heterosexuals. Huh? Mm -hmm. One of the most famous uh, Edith Piaf song is uh, Mon Beau Legionnaire, uh, who, who smell like hot sand. It, it, it's a kind of guy before the Second World War, there was, there were at least two films, one with Jean Gabin portraying Legionnaire. They were representing a sort of freedom that, of course, was very erotic in films. They, they were um, protected. They could change their name. So it means in a Romanesque way that they had a heavy past. It was allowed to be brutal and violent because there they were trained as soldiers that were ready to die. So they were always sent in the worst places as a balance to that kind of freedom they would receive. And they couldn't be married. And so they had this kind of uh, image always. So I was not surprised. I was not looking for that, but I was not surprised. Even, even for women, but women are used to, you know, so they don't... Um, I've been invited to a nightclub in Paris that doesn't exist anymore now, called La Luna, where you, you enter the place and there was, you, you would deposit your clothes. It was a, a gay nightclub and wear um, foreign legion uniform. <laughs> and in the cellar, you had all the training things, you know. 
working and <laughs> doing poetry. <laughs> and I was invited as an honor, and I could wear the uniform. <laughs> <laughs> I was drunk before, I tell you. <laughs> no, but it, I understand that, you know. I understand why. Because we are, um, and me included, thirsty for an ideal life that is not chaotic, where everything is in order, with an aim. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also why young men from many countries, you, you don't know because of subtitles, but they all have a different accent, are still attracted to be, to go into mm -hmm. the legend. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that, and I think it's not, it's funny, but deep, deeply enough, we can understand that life is not offering so much, you know, so I, now when I meet in the subway in Paris, when I see a legionnaire is never alone, there are always two. It's called a binom. There could never be one guy alone, unless he has left the legend or he's too drunk. But I have always a feeling of as if I was um, waving them, because I've been watching from a distance the real training, and I. It's not because they are tan and mu and they have good bodies, it's because they, the foreign legend is the last place where you can uh, find, a, find a meaning to a meaningless life, in a way, you know. Or if you have been doing something you regret, I mean, it's too much. So. In fact, when I was doing Manhattan work, uh, shooting Manhattan Bunny in Marseille, my hotel was near the harbor, and when we were shooting nights, there was only one cafe near the hotel open at five in the morning. And in the, I used to go there with my crew, and every time there was those lonely legionnaires uh, and then we used to have a beer with them, and I think that's why probably I choose mm -hmm. uh, foreign mm -hmm. legend. There's something really touching too about yeah. the way the the you have these um, rituals, the um, uh, the the digging. Mm -hmm. But then you have that I dance mean, it's ritual. ridiculous. They're in the middle of stone desert <laughs> yeah. dig, you know. <clears throat> but there's also the domestic rituals that are always mm -hmm. intercut with them. Like in this mm -hmm. in this clip, chopping mm -hmm. the chopping the food, we see them ironing. Mm -hmm. It's 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 um, it's not just rituals, but it's rituals of of what might seem to be very very different, very very different kinds. But it probably provide a sort of life that is ritualized and mm -hmm. and hide. What, mm -hmm. what is probably inhuman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After the enormous success of Beau Travail, Trouble Every Day, um, came out, which I think has been your most controversial film, maybe, along with I Can't, I Can't mm. Sleep. Um, in the film, um, I, I, I say yes and not to everything you say, because <laughs> I'm, I'm, yes, I, I believe, yes, probably, yeah, no. You know, I, I, after a film, you don't know. Uh, it's better not to know. And <laughs> no, you know. In this film, you have 
um, people who are possessed by some kind of mysterious condition where sexual desire leads to the desire to devour and to bite and to tear apart. They have taken some kind of drugs that they were not supposed to take that could probably reveal or exaggerate libido. Usually when you see red in this film, it's blood. Um, so it's interesting in the laboratory that you have these, you know, lined up. Should have got that scene. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fun. It was the explanation scene uh, with everyone looked dumb and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but Vincent I like the little vegetable, rotten vegetable in the, I, I love those. <laughs> And the liquid turning. I never know. I never knew whether they were um, vegetable or hunks of flesh suspended in. Actually, this lab was a lab that was testing um, transformation in, in vegetables, you know, in, in, in plants. And mm. yeah. Well, the little round things, you can tell that they're plants, but mm. some of those shapes are a mm. little, um, are a little uh, crazy. Only me, I know. I don't tell you. Um, let's move yeah. to the to the last clip from um, Vendredi Soir from Friday mm. uh, from Friday night because we want to leave time for questions from the audience. Um, this is a film based and I well, except for Beau Travail, which is sort of inspired by Billy Budd. Um, I don't think you ever did an adaptation of a novel. No, and before. it's not inspired. It's really I adapted the book like line by line. Mm -hmm. I really wanted the mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. And um, it's about a woman who has a one-night stand um, mm -hmm. with, a, uh, with a man. The casting here is really interesting because uh, Valérie Le Mercier, who plays the, um, the woman, the woman um, is known as a comedian in, in, in France. And so this is a... She's not only known, she's, she's, she's famous. The, the, com the French comedian. Like, yeah. uh, she's hilarious, I must say. And of course, it was a big, big um, surprise for people, even for my producer, to have her cast in yeah. that part. Yeah, but she's terrific in the in the role. The scene that we're going to see um, in the novel, the way you you did this, I think, is really interesting because it's not easy to transpose uh, a novel to um, to the screen. And at but this point, yeah, the novel is is already the people were. It's a, it's a very short novel, mm -hmm. and nobody. <coughs> I mean, I really try. Yeah, line by line, it's yeah. in the film. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the first encounter between the woman and the man who she will um, shortly spend the spend the night with. I hope you know it's it's a. It's not like that in Paris. Right? It's a. Tra <laughs> it's a traffic jam because there is a strike. Normally, <laughs> yeah, no one would do such a thing. Um, yeah, the novel is it the night was it 1995? The, yeah, yeah, the yeah. novel is based there was on a, a inspired huge by strike, yeah. and it was freezing cold for three weeks, so people were <coughs> encouraged to pick up people mm -hmm. on the street and give them rides. But of course, there were traffic jams as well. In the novel, when um, the woman sees the man on the street. She imagines that he's going to meet um, the woman in the other car yeah. next to her. The way you do this, I think, is just terrific because the blonde whom we see is a much more conventionally pretty um, heroine. Um, and you can sense this kind of imaginary you know, um, scenario that she's going over in her mind. And the look on her face when he, he comes to the door of the car is just terrific, that kind of like, you know, the fantasy is broken in a way, but interrupted in a way, but I, I just don't, beginning. I don't know if it succeeds, but as, uh, if it's like that in the film, I don't know. But what I like with um, the novel is that the woman is, the, the complete novel is in her mind. So that was difficult in a film, mm -hmm. but she's never taking for granted she could interest that man. Mm -hmm. Not even at the end, you mm -hmm. know? So, 
I think with uh, this actress, with Valérie, with, who didn't believe in herself as an actress, there was something very touching for me. Well, it was really um, unexpected. I had been uh, working with a few French directors, and uh, I, I, by chance, I met uh, Vim in Portugal, and he asked me to work with him. And at a, t at a time where already I was starting to write scripts and trying to, to make a first film. And then as I was doing location scouting for Paris, Texas with Vim, I, with Vim Vendors, um, I, I, I met John Lurie and John Lurie introduced me in a very normal way to Jim Jarmusch, who, who had done permanent vacation at that time only and was still editing uh, um, Stranger Than Paradise. So a year after he asked me to work with him for Down By Law, almost as a joke actually. I was already pre in pre-production in Cameroon preparing chocolat and I, I flew from Cameroon to New Orleans. I mean, they were like uh, giving me a sort of last energy I needed to cope with my first film. We grew up together making films and it's not reducing your talent to say that um, it's a mutual, mutual in understanding, you know. I, I don't need to give her a lot of freedom because we are surfing the same waves, you know what I mean? So um, the question <coughs> was never asked. Do you need more freedom? And yes, I mean, we, are, we still are free together. We don't, we, we, we like, I don't know. Our work has been um, yeah, it's, it's like a sort of um, communion, you know, it's She's the only person I can say I think about film in in few words, and I'm sure she will understand. Although in in between films we we have very little to share. We are not even best friend, you know. But in filmmakings, we are, um, we don't need words, I, I guess. One critic <clears throat> referred to you and Agnès Godard as, I thought this was hilarious, but I'm supposed, I suppose it's appropriate in some way, as the all-girl band of contemporary French cinema. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, it, it was not planned. We met and, and it, it, it happened that our taste grew together for with the same desire the, at the same moment. The thing is, when I'm in France, I'm a bizarre filmmaker or a strange <laughs> filmmaker. And when I'm abroad, I, I don't feel I'm a French filmmaker, I feel Sometimes it's written in the program, but um, even sometimes female French filmmaker, you know. <laughs> you, you know, I don't know. The good thing about traveling with films is to meet people 
will ask you questions about film um, in a way that you can forget, that I can forget I'm a French filmmaker and also that I'm a, a female French filmmaker. I never forget I'm a woman, but I try to forget I'm a French woman filmmaker, that's for sure, you know. <laughs> <laughs>